space always fascinated me. It's like you point the telescope at something that doesn't look like there's anything there. And then sometimes after like months, you finally start to see kind of like a, a picture come together and you see all the details come out. And if you look at it in the night sky, it just looks like there's nothing there. A lot of people feel really small. I actually feel really big because you can understand like there is space. We're a species that can somewhat, in some ways we can understand the vastness of it. And especially like I have this one uh, photo I took, I called it a beach of stars. It was like a, a, a picture of the core of the Milky Way. And there's just like, you just see tens of thousands of, of stars and dots and every single one of them is a, is a star. So much so it looks like you're looking at like a sandy beach. So yeah, you can definitely feel small, but not, not for me. <laughs> We, we got a telescope to start a family tradition. So we're, we're Muslim and uh, we, there's a moon sighting that you do for the beginning of Ramadan. So we bought, we bought a telescope to kind of like see the moon. And for a, a couple of years, it kind of just went, we would use it on that day, but we wouldn't use it the rest of the year. And then I started taking pictures of the moon with it. And then I started watching a couple of YouTube videos. So with people doing like astrophotography. I thought it was like really neat. I was like, can you really take pictures with a telescope? So I hooked up uh, my DSLR to the telescope that we had. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and I pointed it at the, at the Orion Nebula. Took a picture of it and it's the most t terrible picture, but it's still my favorite picture. <laughs> I got a picture of the Orion Nebula. I was like, holy, like, I can't believe it. Like, it, it was mind boggling to me that I could take a picture of this thing. I, I really didn't know what I was doing, but I was hooked. A lot of people think that you need like so much equipment to get started in a hobby. And this is actually a perfect example of why that's not true. <laughs> this is just a mirrorless camera, but it could be a DSLR. It doesn't need to be a mirrorless camera. And this is a, just a regular tripod, and this is a, a star tracker, which is an inexpensive tool for tracking the night sky. So you really honestly don't need much, and you would be amazed at all of the stuff that you can get with this, everything from the Milky Way to very like deep sky nebulas and galaxies. Once you get beyond star tracking, you want to have like accurate alignment and to get everything over very long exposures then you start adding more equipment and one thing i'll say is everything here is additive so for the most part the only things that you really need is a camera which is here i've got a dedicated astronomy camera and the the lens and your mount everything else is additive a lot of people think that just get the highest magnification you can afford you know and I'm the exact reason why I should never do that, right? Like, yeah, so when, when we got the, the, the big telescope and I remember like, I, I took a picture of it and sent it to my, my friend John and he was like, oh my God, you're crazy. Like, because it was, it was really difficult to use and so I ended up like sitting in my basement. This <laughs> is, uh, is the big one. People like to use these for um, planetary imaging because because it has such high magnification. You can see a small planet, really. You can see it very sharp. Okay, so this is uh, this is my baby. This is my favorite one. <laughs> I've actually set it up so that it does everything automated. I can actually have it like image while I sleep, <laughs> and then um, I also have like an automation so that if anything goes wrong in the middle of the night while it's imaging. It'll actually send me a push notification to my phone. So the, those objects, the, the really bright ones, you don't need a whole lot of exposure. You know, an exposure on, a, on the Orion Nebula of 30 minutes with a color camera, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see it in, in a single exposure, actually. As you go through the process and get deeper and deeper into it, you want to see the more and more dim objects. Uh, and then you, you do it over a, a number of days and, and months. Yes, it's more difficult in light polluted skies in the Bortle 9 like Chicago, but it's not impossible. You have to use different techniques. So one example is like in light polluted skies, using narrow band filters is kind of a lifesaver. What they do is they build these filters that are in a very narrow part of the visible light spectrum that hydrogen just so happens to, or sulfur or oxygen, 
Um, just so happens to emit the light uh, in, in that portion of the visible light spectrum. And then there's a lot of software now that removes, they do what's called gradient removal. It's actually part of the process <laughs> where you'll remove the gradient out of the image in post-processing. And then yeah. that's it for now, right? Now we wait till dark. There's no manufacturing. We, we, I do that <laughs> things, a lot of times. <laughs> like, if it's warm enough, yeah, I'll sit oh, out Oh, it's going to be hot tomorrow, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll sit out here and drink tea and just hang out. That uh, dichotomy exists of observing versus doing photography. I really like the, the process of tinkering, the, the, the technology. Now, having said that, a lot of people in the astronomy club that I'm a member of will absolutely love observing. They enjoy just finding objects in the sky, the hunt for the, for the object. From my perspective, I like the creativity of, of when you do an astrophoto because each astrophoto actually says a lot also about the, the photographer. It has to be the right time of the year to pick the target that you want, you want to take. So oh, there's only certain things out like right now. The second thing is you have to frame it up. So similar to like terrestrial photography, you have to know how you want to frame it. And then you, you set up your telescope. Now I use software to actually pull that. And then in that you select the object that you want. There's definitely a lot of software. And the really nice thing about the astrophotography community is a lot of the software is free. In fact, in terms of software, there's really not much you have to pay for. So I, most of the images I take are with a monochrome camera, and then I use a filter on top of that. So the, the filter then, if it's a narrowband image, it's like hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Or if it's a broadband image, then you're doing LRGB. Yeah, then, then it's like capturing images over maybe a week, maybe longer. Sometimes there's like rain in between. <laughs> I have to take it inside. But yeah, for the most part, I'll leave it. Uh, I'll leave it out. I pick how long the exposure should be. Usually, I would say I usually take five minute exposures. And then I, you, you pick how many of them you want. Right now I'm taking a, a, an image of the elephant trunk nebula. I think I did like eight hours per filter. The last few years, I've gotten much more into like the really long exposure. So over 20 hours of exposure because you see so much more of the structures of the nebulae. I really enjoy taking pictures of nebula more than anything else. There's a point where there's diminishing returns. There's actually some people now who are uh, doing astrophotography but like finding new objects in the sky that nobody's ever found before. Amateurs, so that's, that's pretty cool. But was it like, it's not like what you would imagine. <laughs> so the first part of it is to actually review all of the individual frames. You stack all your light frames. Now you have an image that still, you can't see anything, <laughs> but if you stretch it, so if you stretch the histogram on your image, now you're, you're able to actually see each of the channels. Then it's a matter of like eliminating noise out of the image. So using noise reduction tools, removing gradients to get rid of any of the light pollution or some of the issues that you might, you might have had a smudge or something on your telescope done with my images and I, I get them combined. So I'll, you'll ma I'll map these filters to color channels. Uh, I usually, usually will use either the Hubble palette, which is sulfur goes to red, hydrogen goes to green, and then oxygen goes to blue. Play with the tool is called the curves tool, where you're, you know, bringing out uh, the more bright objects and then dimming the more dim objects and playing with the contrast and the brightness to get it just right. There's certainly an aspect of art to it a little bit, you know, where, you know, a lot of times, and it usually you have to be very careful. You want to stay true to the data is what we say, right? So you're not trying to like add color or remove color, but you might, for example, increase some vibrance uh, or increase some saturation just to bring out the colors a little bit more because they're, you know, they're just dull. 
it also tells a little bit about the astrophotographer. You'll see there's different styles actually. Some people will push their data more than others. Some people like to stay very true to the data. They don't do any of the vibrance or saturation or anything like that. I like to kind of think about, well, how, you know, how do I relate to this, to this picture? And usually I'll write like some, some big write-up on, uh, on it that I'm sure nobody reads, but <laughs> I enjoy writing it. <laughs> so, in, in a lot of ways, for me, it speaks to how amazing the, the human mind really is. Every single time you go out there, you learn some new thing. And uh, if you're not learning, it's actually a problem because there's an infinite amount of things you can learn in this hobby. Yeah, I, I think that would be the big thing is I, I didn't need to go to space camp, you know? <laughs> Thanks for watching. Subscribe to discover more hobbies and visit notjustthehobby.com to learn more.